Good evening all, I'm Tab Binding and I'm your programme manager for the Riverside Sunderland University Design Challenge. And this is week four of the webinar series that, longs, that runs alongside it. So Tuesday, we started with structural engineering. Um, Wednesday, we did procurement costing and placemaking. And tonight, which is Thursday, is all about future homes. Our challenge for participants is a fantastic site up in Sunderland, outlined here in red. We're asking you to design an indicative um, plan for 100 homes, but to design, engineer, detail and cost one family three bed home that sits on a nine by six metre footprint. Our speakers tonight are David and Fionn and Jerry, Rachel, Ella, John, Neil and myself. And with that, I'd like to hand over to our, um, our first speaker, David Birkbuck, who is Chief Executive of Design for Homes. David. I'm going to talk a little bit about land economy and uh, you've got this competition coming up. You've got to design something that will fit on a nine by six plot. It's 54 square meters. That's quite efficient. If you think about the majority of houses would probably demand at least twice that. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of extremely efficient uh, designs that do it. I'm also going to talk about what might happen to the apartment market and whether we will see apartment buildings like we've historically seen. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit about silk, satin and sex. So this is a picture you may be familiar with from Bridgen. Um, and if you watch any of these costume dramas, one of the tropes that they always use in them is that people have to make their way at speed through corridors. So here's Emma Stone in the rival heading off to see the queen to make some kind of demand on the queen i can't remember exactly what happened in this scene but this is a repeated trope throughout the the film and you'll see them go up and down this corridor repeatedly uh, the problem is it doesn't really exist there were no corridors at the time houses like hatfield house were built there were things called galleries or long galleries and you can see the plan here and this is the place where, you know, essentially the courtiers and the, the host's principal sort of gems would be on display. This was a sort of meeting space. It was a little bit like the bar in a hotel or so. It certainly wasn't a corridor. And in fact, you know, we didn't have corridors. We didn't have circulation space at that time. And you can have a look at, you know, one of the, one of the tenement blocks in New York from around about the end of the American Civil War. It, you know, they didn't use what we now have, those kind of enclosed hotel type corridors in apartment buildings. They had vertical steps going up and down on, as if you're in a ship. Um, and, you know, it's very, very dangerous. Um, that's why when you walk around somewhere like the Lower East Side, you see all these fire escapes on the outside. And there were no ways out except for from your apartment and down and if one of them was on fire in trouble. So hence you saw these being built. So really, you know, think in terms of circulation space as we know it now is a new thing. It just didn't exist for a very long time. You know, neither did apartments generally. Look at this. This is a quote from 1871 when the Royal Institute of British Architects got really huffy about the fact that Haussmann was developing these buildings which they'd never seen the like of in the rebuild of Paris. And, you know, they, they, could, they didn't even know what to insult them as. They referred to them as arrangements were utterly dissociated and discordant people lived under one roof. You know, so what they were really kicking back against was the, the idea that nice people would live in the same building as shopkeepers and so on. How could they? Anyway, that was then, but things keep changing. The Housing Design Awards keeps a record of this. And I don't know if any of you use this, but the website, which is hdawards.org, is the largest of its kind in the English speaking world. And it's not just lots of dry analysis of housing schemes. There's a lot of interviews with the residents in our own version of post occupancy where we ask people, does this work? Because the, the remit of the awards is to find out whether these new designs are actually comfortable and whether people like them. And I strongly recommend you watch the film about the Gables, uh, the one I keep pointing to here, which is 
two or three interviews with households that actually live in them and they, they give you a clue on to, you know, what new arrangements feel like, what they, what they actually sort of do for you in terms of quality of life. Um, one of the schemes that over the years sort of created a lot of no notoriety at first, but subsequently won a housing design award is a Barclay Homes design where they tried to replace apartment buildings with houses that would plot at 120 homes to the hectare. Now, we, you know, we're really into the type of sort of footprint here that you're being asked to tackle in your competition with a narrow fronted house, which is deep plan. And you're probably talking about five meters by say nine deep or so. So, you know, you're, you're, it's hitting that kind of 54 square meters. Um, this likewise, probably close-ish to what you're being targeted. This is the Gable scheme in Liverpool in Formby. And when you look at this from one angle, you can see that there's some kind of first floor terrace. Now that first floor terrace is the outdoor space to this dwelling because it's a back to back. If you look at the plan here, you'll see that these units, they actually butt up to each other at the back and the space for these, the private outdoor space, which would normally be a back garden, is in fact, as you can see here, is a terrace at the first floor level. So this is a completely different design. It's extremely efficient. It's very nice inside. And I have to say the households I interviewed thought it was the best thing they'd ever come across in their experience of housing. So it seems to work and it's, it's beginning to become a design that's being explored by various people. And there are fundamental reasons for this. It's extremely efficient. I mean, a normal house type would plot on a site that big at about say 20, you'd get on, on that scheme. There were 30 on that one because of that particular design trick. You know, if you can get 50% more units and you're getting better units as well, then you'll see it catch on. Now, so this is the Barclay Home Scheme, 10 years on from its original sketch. This is a slightly touched up photograph, which is typical of unfortunately house builders. They, they will always supply me with photographs that have been doctored. But you'll see there are various things on there which are interesting. You've got the, the bin stores and bike stores to the front. Some of them have even got PVs on the top, not, none in this particular picture. You can use this area here as essentially a private space or you can park your car on it. But you see at the top here, you've got this fence as you go up through the dwelling part of it from the second floor up to the third floor on a spiral staircase and then you arrive at these sort of private outdoor spaces and it's quite ingenious I mean this is quite special space as well because you're up high you're looking over all the kind of leafy green parks that you get in places like Greenwich and, it, and it's really you know a very successful design um, that is the MHCLG's head of architecture um, and you know he he went around it, I think he was very impressed as well. And of course they make these things in factories and float them down the Thames. So we're really, really entering the 21st century with something like this, both in its design and construction. This is a particular scheme I'm fascinated by. I actually think this development is the best one in Western Europe at the moment. And I strongly recommend everybody makes a visit to have a really good look around. It's a scheme called Great Knighton. It's 2,300 homes and very, very um, unusually for any size scheme like this. I mean, you get niche schemes of all kinds all the time. But this one, despite being 2,300 homes, has nearly all its houses with its private amenity space wholly or predominantly on upper floors rather than in gardens. So, you know, this is a phase here, which is extremely efficient. I'll show you some of the statistics on it and some of the plan forms. But if you look at this, this particular house type is called the Burwell. If you look at the size of it on the right there, 176.4 square meters, nearly 1900 square feet. That's a very, very big dwelling. And um, that's probably about 50% bigger than most four story, more, most four bedroom house types sold by the big volume builders. Um, and then you look at the plan form, you'll see that it has these integral garages. They're controlled by PIRs. So as you drive up there and you just drive straight in, you see you've got the part end bedroom at the ground floor level, stairs that go up to a first floor, uh, sort of open plan living, dining and kitchen space. And then that space is connects to another bedroom and you've got this sort of shared terrace. You can open the French windows to go onto it from the dining space or from the bedroom space. And then up one more floor and you've got these two bedrooms with their own private terraces and there's a void between them. Now the parapet here is about sort of chest high and it's built in brick. Um, if you think about what most balconies are like, they tend to be glazed or they tend to be in some way open. Um, 
you know, they're never that private. You sit outside, you, you've virtually got to look exactly the same as you have to when you leave your house. You couldn't sneak out there, read the newspaper in your uh, pants one morning on a Sunday with a hangover or something. You have to get dressed up. But these places like this with this brick parapet are very, very private. And the fact they're not connected means that, you know, you could have one couple living in this space, one couple living in that space, and they're both getting very, very private amenity space. So big house, very private outdoor space, almost no gardens to maintain, but at the same time, plenty of outdoor room. It's probably the reason why this has been the fastest selling house type that countryside have ever built. And, you know, the acid test for something like this is how much the public want it. And if they're literally fighting each other to buy them, you know, you've got a good product. So it's a very ingenious design and it's got a floor plate, which will probably match up roughly to what your competition brief is. There is another item at uh, Great Nighting, which is also worth looking at, three-story apartment building with deck access. Now, you know, at three stories, you don't need to fit lifts as long as it's not managed housing. You can if you want to, but essentially the majority of, of apartment buildings in uh, these kind of locations, it's very difficult to justify the cost of a lift the maintenance and the fact you're going to have to replace it within 20 years at a million pounds. So if you can come up with a design that's dual aspect, relatively low cost to build like this, and you don't need any management charges for the common parts, it's a very good idea. So just a quick resume here, why these schemes are really important. I mean, that phase at Great Night and I showed you with the Burwell house type, it's plotting at 43,560 square feet to the acre. Some of you will know that that is a square acre. So it's got, a, it's actually got a floor area ratio of one. If you told people that you were building a scheme with a floor area ratio of one, they'd assume automatically it had to be apartments. It's almost unheard of to see anything remotely like a far of one where it's houses. But on this particular phase of this de development, 270 units, only eight are not direct street access properties. So you've got 262 of these houses at plotting at this incredibly dense coverage rate. They're all freehold. Well, no one wants to lease old property at the moment. There are no management charges. There are no common parts people have to pay for. There are no lifts that are going to bite you on the arse in about 20 years time. And importantly for the, the key people who are behind tonight's organization, you know, three stories is the sweet spot for timber engineering. This is the point where if you're building in timber as a construction system, you invariably beat the masonry um, tender. So it's also a very interesting design because the entire development essentially is three stories. Okay, I think my 10 minutes are up. Thank you, David. That was, yeah, um, amazing. Yeah, you've given our, our participants a whole nother, um, yeah, a thing to think about. Um, yeah, and with that, I'd like to hand over to um, Professor Fionn Stevenson, who's going to introduce us to post-occupancy evaluation and why you should think of that at the beginning and not at the end. Fionn. Thanks very much, Tab. Um, just going to share my screen and bring up the presentation, um, which will be available afterwards. Um, so yeah, just for 15 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce post-occupancy. So the main thing I want to get across is why we need to look at how housing works in reality when we're actually designing and, and why we need feedback all the time. So this is a kind of typical dream um, sketch. This one is an old sketch by Terry Farrell. Um, and it's just kind of brainstorming all the interesting things we can get into our homes uh, to make them green. Um, but the problem is when we design homes, they still tend to underperform. So for example, a few years ago, we had four and a half million homes overheating in the UK. And we've also got about five and a half million people suffering from asthma in the UK. And interestingly enough, we're beginning to realize that these, these um, health problems are not just outside of the home with car pollution. They're also inside the home, often with damp um, or with off-gassing from um, polluting materials. 
Um, the damp is often because um, the designers haven't fully understand understood the reality of what they're designing in terms of how the homes are going to be used, how they're going to be ventilated and how they're going to be heated. So we've got major challenges um, still with our housing performance. Um, and why is this happening? This is a great slide um, from the wonderful Lewis Hellman, sadly departed. Um, basically, as designers, we are still flying blind. Our design team is. And that's because our design intentions are only as good as what we know. There's still no legal requirement for um, designers to have to receive feedback from the real performance of their buildings once they're up and running. Um, it's not even there in the new Future Homes 2025 document, not full post-occupancy evaluation. So the trouble is we really, when we design, uh, we often really don't know what happens from one project to the next. It was wonderful to see David's um, interviews with the residents, um, and it would be great to know that um, every architecture practice is going back to the occupants, um, asking them how their buildings are really working, and not just talking with the occupants, but actually looking at how the buildings are working. And fundamentally, we don't teach you guys we don't teach you as students how to learn from building performance happening in reality. Um, if we did, we'd get what I call the organizational learning smile, where we would just automatically think about getting feedback from buildings, getting feedback from what's around us in a real way as we design briefs and as we design our buildings. So what are we trying to do when we're evaluating housing performance for real? Well, the first thing we're trying to do is to compare our uh, design intentions to reality. The next thing we're trying to do is actually look at the hard data, look at the comfort levels, the temperature levels, how, how loud um, things are inside the home, uh, how good the lighting is, um, what the indoor air quality is like, whether the fabric is performing, and fundamentally how much energy and water we're using. So that's kind of hard data. And then as David touched on earlier, we're also really interested in the soft data, which is not just about satisfaction, how satisfied people are with their homes, but whether these homes actually meet their needs. And more importantly, whether these homes actually meet their capabilities. Um, that is whether people have the capacity to do what you're asking them to do in the homes you've designed for them. And that's really, really important when you think of disability and access for all. And we're also interested to know whether people actually learn in their homes, whether the homes are designed to be learnt so that people can learn how to use them. And we're interested in how much control people feel, have, feel they have over their homes. So what we do is we look at the hard and soft data that we can gather and we compare that to the design intentions. And this is what all architecture practices should be doing. And this is what all schools of architecture should be teaching students about. But how do we actually do this in education? So I'm gonna boil it down to just four questions you need to think about when you're designing. Is your home going to physically perform as it's expected to perform? Will the inhabitants be happy? Are there any problems that are going to be needed to solve just right now? And how can we improve things for the future? I'm going to introduce you as students to what I call a light touch POE with just six simple actions that you can do for any case study that you get involved with as students. So when your tutors suggest you do a case study or that you do a field trip, don't just settle for walking around a building and looking at things. Get more involved. Get more involved following these six steps. So the first thing to do with a case study building is to look at the design intentions, look at the drawings, look at the specifications. Then see if you can get hold of how much energy and water the building is actually using. And that can often be quite easy to do if your tutors are collaborating with the client of the building. Then you can do a quick thermographic survey and I'll come on to that. And finally, a quick chat with the inhabitants or you can do a quick questionnaire with them. But the important thing always is to do a tour and to do the tour bearing the first four things in mind. And finally, you can do spot checks of what's actually going on in the building.
Now you'll notice with these six steps, there are no sensors, there's no monitoring. And so this is a really great approach for actually looking at case studies in reality. Now, every school of architecture should have one of these. It's a thermographic imaging camera. And if your school hasn't got one, and if your tutors aren't able to give you one, shame on them, and you should ask for one. They're really wonderful. They're like a pair of X-ray specs. You need some training in how to use them. And your school should be training you guys as architects in how to use thermal imaging cameras. They're like a stethoscope for the patient. If you're the doctor and the building is the patient, then this is your stethoscope. And here you can see the stethoscope revealing that although this building apparently is well insulated, actually it's not. The red is where the insulation is missing. And if you don't want a clunky camera, then buy one of these devices. Get your school to buy one. This costs about £200. It's made by um, Seek, and you can just clip it onto your phone. Or you can get one by FLIR. These are very easy to use. Every school should also have these very simple, simple mobile spot testing equipment that students can take out to their case studies and actually check how the building's performing. This can measure the temperature, the lighting levels, the acoustics and the humidity levels, all in one simple tool. Now, these are not particularly accurate, but they do give you a reality check against what people are saying. So if the residents are saying, yeah, we're really happy and we're really satisfied, and you notice that in fact, the temperature is 14 degrees centigrade, maybe there's a reality check needed. Maybe you need to ask why the residents are feeling happy. And it may be because they're wearing lots and lots of clothes and they actually can't afford to heat their homes. So this talk is all about how to empower you to discover feedback through your education and to discover feedback you can use. So basically, for any design project that you're doing in your school, um, have a look at other case studies that are similar to it and try and see if you can interview the design team from that particular case study and try and engage with the building client. Try and ask to meet some occupants, interview them, try and ask to do the tour and compare what you discover with the actual design intentions that have been written about in the AJ or in the RIBA journal or any other publication. In other words, do your own reality check to see whether what's been written up in the glossy magazines actually matches the reality. And sometimes, as in this case with Marmalade co-housing, you'll find that things go better than predicted. And that's a wonderful situation. But often you may discover things have gone not quite according to plan, and that's worth finding out. Now you can also do this with your retrofit projects. When you're doing a retrofit project, see if you can engage with the occupants who are in the existing building. Talk to them about their real needs and then build that into the design brief. Don't just accept a design brief from your tutors. See what the occupants actually want. And the great thing about retrofit POE is that you can actually take measurements before the retrofit happens and then do them afterwards. And then you've got some real comparisons. You're not just comparing them to a simulation. I want to give you a quick example about why POE is so fascinating and so interesting. So this was a project we did a number of years ago with a very well-known housing developer. And we looked at an urban retrofit. And you can see in the bottom right corner, this was a typical um, housing block of apartments, council housing block. And what the developer did here with the architect in a very exciting way was they completely transformed these um, uh, apartments which were um, dual aspect and had therefore had cross ventilation into single aspect apartments. And I want to give you a warning about single aspect apartments. They may be attractive in terms of density, but you have to design really, really carefully to make, make them work in terms of ventilation and heating. And there is a reason why back-to-backs were dropped by the Victorians. And if we reintroduce them again now, we have to get them right. So one of the big issues by making this um, set of apartments back to back 
was that they overheated because there was no way to cross ventilate them. One set of apartments were facing west, the other were facing east. And the west facing apartments, because they were single aspect, had no way to cool down. They had very large glazing, you can see it here, very large windows with no shading. Here they are again, no shading. This is what I call a bald building. And these were just overheating. And you can see here that the bedrooms were reaching 35 degrees, yeah? 35 degrees. So really, you know, pretty hot. Now, why was this happening? So when we did the post-occupancy, we didn't just talk to the residents, we also looked at the landscape and we did our own analysis. And we quickly realized that the west facing apartments were facing a black tarmac huge car park. So what was happening was these west facing apartments, which weren't able to uh, ventilate to a cool site, were being given extra heat by the landscape. So post occupancy is not just about the inside of the buildings, it's also about the outside. Now the great news um, about POE is that it's finally gaining traction. And in fact, just today, the Architects Registration Board has launched a consultation on how we might change the education criteria for architecture. And I'm really delighted to see after doing post-occupancy evaluation for 30 years now, that finally the ARB is requesting that students are taught post-occupancy evaluation in schools of architecture. So I really hope all of you who are listening today will go to the ARB website and answer the consultation. And please, please do put forward the case for why we need POE taught in schools of architecture. Now, I realized there was a gap in terms of learning. And so I wrote a book called Housing Fit for Purpose, which I published um, in 2019. And that does give a lot of information about how to do housing POE. And I'm delighted to say that recently, um, the um, Wood Knowledge ne Wales organization, which is a fantastic organization, has just published a free POE toolkit. Um, mine you'd have to pay for. It's very in-depth and every school of architecture should have one so you can see it online. So if it's not in your school of architecture, please ask them to get a copy online and then all of you can see it without having to pay for it. But this one's free, so you could all download it today. The link's here. Uh, and that gives you a fantastic toolkit for thinking about POE beyond the competition. The book has a whole chapter in it on how to educate the educators about POE and also about how students can carry out POE. So again, you might want to get your tutors to have a look at that. And finally, I just want to give a quick plug um, for another role that I've got, which is I'm also the campaigns director for the Building Performance Network UK. And if you are interested in post-occupancy evaluation, then I'd recommend you get involved with this organization because it's specifically there to focus on just this aspect of the whole building performance cycle, which is to look at the post-occupancy stage. So again, that's another resource and the website for that is there. And I think I have finished in record time. So thanks very much for that. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Fionn. Absolutely there fascinating. There's so many good links there. There are some questions in the chat, so if you wouldn't mind um, yeah. um, answering them, that'd be, that'd be fabulous. Um, and can, with that, can I hand over to Jerry Ruffles, who's mm -hmm. Head of Education at Moby. Jerry. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. Yes, <clears throat> um, I'm not so much going to speak to you tonight um, as really I'm just the uh, the warm up guy for our next two guests. Um, and I don't want to use up the valuable time that we've allocated to them. But suffice to say that it is my absolute pleasure, privilege and an honor to uh, introduce these two speakers, um, Rachel Milliner and Eleanor Rogers. They're both architects, 
uh, new amazing architects, um, graduated last summer from Nottingham University and are winners of our Young Persons Home of 2030 um, Design Challenge, <clears throat> which we ran last year with the final judging and awards um, taking place last December. Um, <clears throat> this, this challenge we managed in collaboration with the MHCLG, the RIBA, the BRE and the Design Council, and it ran alongside the Professional Home of 2030 Challenge. Uh, the Young Persons Home of 2030 focused on the design of future homes, um, tackling the, the key challenges facing our society and, and suggesting um, solutions to issues such as the ageing population, multi-generational living, evolving technologies, energy efficiencies and our changing work patterns and lifestyles. We had an absolutely amazing response to the challenge and huge numbers of um, brilliant design su submissions all of an incredibly high standard from each of the four age categories, which range from 11 years to 25 years. In fact, the judges agreed that the, the young people really gave the professionals a very good run for their money. Um, anyway, Rachel won uh, both the 18 to 25 age category and was the well-deserved over overall competition winner. And Ella uh, was a very close by a runner up. Uh, Rachel's incredible design entitled Urban Coexisting uh, aimed to reinvigorate sustainable urban living, bringing animals and urban farming and nature uh, back into the built environment. And Ella's equally brilliant design focused on tackling social isolation within older generations. So I'm delighted to welcome um, them to this evening's webinar, uh, webinar and uh, in, invite these two um, outstandingly talented young architects to tell you about their home of 2030 designs, uh, their competition experience, and their new careers as architects in practice. Thank you, Rachel and Ella. Thank you for that, Claire. Thank you both. <laughs> You've just made us sound much more impressive than we feel, however. Oh, you have to <laughs> live up to the intro now. <laughs> so, um, I guess I'll start. So, me and Ella yeah, entered separately, but did the projects alongside each other at university in collaboration with Nottingham City Homes, um, talking to local residents of the area of the meadows, which you will see in our videos in a minute. And so we did this individually, unlike the interdisciplinary teams, which you guys have. Although I came of it from the perspective of, I also did environmental engineering. So sort of was my own interdisciplinary design team. So tackled it from a slightly different perspective. And the idea of the project was really that in the same, in the vein that Moby wanted to really, it be about the concept and the idea. And so in retrospect, I think maybe the design, there's lots of things I would now change, further reiterate as I take this into my professional career, but it's really about um, having a strong concept and something that uh, just you're really passionate about and just do something that you really like because it's a competition and it's fun. Um, so Ella's just going to play her video now and then we'll come back after. Okay, so let me just... Oh, hang on. Sorry, apologies. I remembered I need to share audio too. Okay, hopefully this will work. Hi, I'm Ella and this is my Home of 2030 design entry. My last two years at university I chose to spend in the Sustainable Community Studio Unit celebrating the centenary of the Addison Act and the great journey of social housing, including the 1970s Radburn Estate, The Meadows. Whilst there were many successes of this green, low-density suburban estate, having the privilege of speaking to past and present residents opened my eyes to the societal changes, in particular the ageing population, which were not predicted in the designing of these nuclear family homes. It was hard for me to move from the meadows. I'd lived there most of my life. All of my friends are there, but after my husband died, I found the house was too big for me. It's more of a family house, really. Much like the Pollard Edward Thomas scheme, in which the women are a support system of their own, the focus of this project is social sustainability, creating environments which are size appropriate, accessible, flexible, and socially secure and interactive. The atypical model of co-housing offers opportunity for an all-female group to share parts of their lives and reduce social isolation without impacting on either that independence or privacy. 
it was then time to think about an environmentally sustainable approach. On visiting the meadows, the number of redundant garage sites was immediately apparent, which were an exciting opportunity for rejuvenating redundant land in the ownership of the council to make affordable architecture with both meaning and heart. On exploring these sites, Oxbow Place seemed perfect. There's the adjacent tram route surrounding pedestrian links, appropriate space between blocks, an opportunity to open up with southwesterly aspect. My initial massing ideas focused around the maximising of daylight, opening up for inward facing front doors and forming a sequence of three outdoor spaces, each characterised to benefit the women and surrounding residents' quality of living. As part of a sustainable design, I believe that architecture must respect the surroundings and I therefore played with using the existing geometries, including footprint dimensions and the distinctive perpendicular blocks, as if the new forms are a contemporary translation of those existing. A key aesthetic of the meadows is the strong monopictures, which are replicated within my scheme to play with the boundaries of dwellings within a form which we've so long associated with single homes. Giving back to the area was vital, and consideration of the importance of these wider interactions gives the women chance to feel they are contributing to the community in creative expressions of place. Certain facades create blank canvases which positively reflect outwards, and architecturally create convergence points to a more private green space behind. There are each public, semi-public and private spaces jigsawed together to provide independence and the chance to socialise within different clusters. Enabling is accentuated through visible circulation, inspired by the classic French film Mon Oncle. I played with Jane Jacobs' concept of eyes on the street to expose the less private elements of the women's routines for an improved sense of security, allowing the women to look out for each other unintrusively. Facades. Again, these are contextually driven, with windows calculated from the ratios and alignment and column pairing observed in the surrounding architecture. Social links with the surroundings are encouraged through the outdoor spaces mentioned and involve interactive tactical urbanism installations and spaces for community gardening. These dynamic communal spaces continue inside at a smaller scale with consistent possibility to engage passively or actively with the people around them, making the world not such an isolating place as an older woman. Recognising the climate emergency is a primary concern of our times. The scheme implements environmentally sound design approaches such as pitch roofs with skylights to cater for natural stack ventilation and angled to receive natural light for healthy internal environments and direct solar gain alongside photovoltaic panels. This combined with thermal wall storage systems provides more consistent internal temperatures, lowering the demand for heating. The materials chosen are purposefully durable to improve the home's lifespans and to require minimal energy use for maintenance. Same applies for the synthetic wreath for underlayment, whilst it can be produced from a polymer recycled from scrap materials and also eliminate VOCs from the underlayment. I hope architecture continues to develop sustainably and adapt to the evolving world we're in. I believe there's plenty of opportunity that can be done to support the groups often overlooked in our society to improve the quality of lives as home really is the most important piece of architecture in our lives. Thank you for watching. So I won't talk for much longer. I forgot how quickly I spoke in that video to try and pack as much in. Um, but Tabitha just suggested that we give um, kind of a short reflection of um, our projects and our experiences in the competition and perhaps what um, I personally would do differently if I was to be entering the Riverside Sunderland competition this time round. Um, and so I've had a look at the new brief, which first of all sounds very exciting. Um, and whilst very different to ours, mine kind of primarily took a social sustainability um, approach. I think that from looking at it, my main piece of advice would be to really um, utilize the multidisciplinary approach as Rachel mentioned um, before. I just think it's a really great opportunity um, to create a really well-rounded project, um, kind of learn from the skill set of your um, fellow students um, and kind of, yeah, really um, get a better understanding about how landscaping, building management, engineering, how they already tie in and influence each other. Um, and as Rachel mentioned previously, um, her course kind of gave her a bit of this insight with some engineering model, modules. And as she's about to show you, I think her project um, is a, just a really great example of what an edge this um, interdisciplinary approach can give you. So yeah, over to Rachel. 
Thank you very much. I will in advance say that Ella's video is much more impressive than mine. And so we just give her props to that. But yeah, I'll let myself talk. And I also apologize for the speed at which I speak, but enjoy. Currently, environmentally conscious living comes with a price tag, but why can't it be ingrained in the design of our homes? Not just sustainable architecture, but productive. Urban coexisting, developed over the centenary of the Addison Act in research collaboration with Nottingham City Home, addresses the brief by reinvigorating suburban living bringing animals, urban farming and nature back into the built environment in a mutually beneficial way. The Meadows is a 1960s Bradburn estate in Nottingham. Dotted throughout are garage sites that are attracting antisocial behaviour. This scheme proposes to turn these garage sites into housing, densifying the estate and creating a network of urban farming across the Meadows. The Meadows has a strong community spirit and reaching out to the already existing AMC community gardens, as sheep walkers propose. Food supply chains create 13.7 billion metric tonnes of CO2e, Farms represent 61% of this. By investing in urban farming, we can provide residents access to fresh, healthy food whilst also reducing our carbon footprint. For this proposal, Oxbo Close has been developed in detail. It is typical of the meadows and characterised by red brick housing, no buildings above three storeys, and pitch roofs. Through industrialisation and suburbanism, England has lost its natural biodiversity. In Nottingham, 97% of flower meadows have been lost since 1930. Bringing back this loss will be vital to tackling climate change as green infrastructure provides suds, reduces the urban heat island effect, stores carbon, provides evaporative cooling and improves air quality. By designing with a model of sustainable development, we can tackle economic, social and environmental issues. This scheme will use a circular economy to design, assessing the whole life cycle of the building, following the space 10 research into co-living what people are willing to share to reduce in-use of body carbon. The building is three super insulated living units made from standardised wood and brick prefab construction, wrapped in a winter garden with a shared co-living ground floor. The ground floor is shared between the humans and animals. It can be opened up to the community. On the first floor is each living unit, suitable for single occupancy or a couple. The small units are designed as a foot in the door for young adults who want to live sustainably but currently cannot afford to. Each unit has its own staircase to its own individual greenhouse above. Each garret across the meadows can be adapted to the needs of different residential groups. Natural ecosystems are the best circular economy, so it makes sense to learn from them for our own design. Nature has spent geological time scales refining passive climate control techniques. Termites build nests in climates they cannot survive, passively controlling the internal microclimate through stack ventilation. The ventilation strategy of this scheme is inspired by these nests. The building has three environmental goals, maximize solar gain, maximize growing space, and increase biodiversity. This section describes the environmental strategy super insulation, green walls, rainwater collection, solar panels, evaporative cooling, and natural ventilation. Urban coexisting should win because it is joyful but grounded in reality. This image shows the potential of the internal space being used on a farm to table day. The strategies and techniques used in this project are not new or complex. They are passive strategies that will improve quality of life and reduce cost of living. Access to nature has been proven to have positive mental and physical health impact. COVID has proven to us once again the importance of investing in our community and by 2030, let's provide communities with the quality of housing they deserve. Thank you for your time. Oh, you don't need to see it. So, um, yeah, I'll just round us up, I guess, by saying that um, entering this competition has opened... I'll just continue being a hobbyist of podcasts. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's, that's all me. I've just continued playing. Anyway, so this competition opened... So many doors to us, even though clearly I'm incredibly unprofessional. Um, <laughs> and I just say really use this opportunity because we were suggested to enter this competition by a member of the local council and we've enjoyed every step of it. And so, yeah, really use these incredible resources being provided to you and enjoy it. Have a good time. Yeah, and good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Ella and Rachel. Um, yeah. It shows yeah what you can get from from this and um yeah really pleased uh, thank you so much um can i introduce you to john nielsen who i met through um this competition and uh, yeah fabulous contacts john and who is the chair of construction the construction industry council northeast john Thank you. I think, can everybody hear me? And uh, I don't have any slides or anything like that to, uh, to run through. Um, interesting talks that I've heard to date, an awful lot of architecture. Uh, construction involves a big team. 
and you all need each other. Uh, that's, a, that's a definite aspect to it. I think what I've been asked to do is simply introduce to you um, the concept of having a construction team. Who is in your team? It's not all architects, it's not all engineers. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of great stuff from architects. A lot of that can't be done without a structural engineer's input or a SIBSI engineer's input. Can't be done without the QS actually uh, pricing it right. And then the client on board taking it in and listening to it all and accepting uh, what they're hearing. So the first thing I would always suggest in actually in developing up your team is you've always got to have at the start of any construction project a good link with the client. It's vital that you understand his brief, you understand his ethos. What, what are they after? What is it they're looking for? And what can you, with your skills, give? Uh, the skills of, of all of us are really much required over the next few years. Uh, this is not an industry that's going to go quiet. This is an industry that's going to go ballistic. You can see it happening already um, in what is required, especially with climate change. So I think the main thing to do when you're setting up your team is I fully understand. I've heard some great uh, architects and heard a lot about architecture there. Uh, there is more to construction than architecture, especially in design. Um, I have a great belief. Now, I'm an engineer, and you might recognize that from the vehemence I'm talking against architects, but I'm not really that. So I love you all anyway. But the one thing about architects is that my view is you lead the design you actually lead the overall thought of what is to be there visually and functional at the end the rest of us actually what we do is provide the ability to you attain that that means we have to understand fully the structure i saw some interesting stuff there say from i think it was ella at the last and i'd be very interested to know how she would support some of the roofs that she's shown there in a nice big open area um, a large span requires, I believe, a large beam, unless it's specifically uh, an expensive and uh, condensed beam. These sort of things is where you need the other team and the other aspects of your team to assist. Uh, it's not something you can design. It's not something when you join industry, they'd be expecting you to design. However, they would be expecting that you fully understand that when I'm designing everything, um, you actually have to know roughly what I'm looking at in relation to, you know, where's the plant room going to go? Where's the SIBSI? Where's all the mechanical electrical uh, engineering uh, aspects going? Are we providing natural ventilation? Uh, are we looking at the, um, the health and safety of the whole scheme? There's a principal designer required. Hope you all fully understand and you've all been fully briefed on your legal duties under the CDM regulations. They are legal. And if you don't comply with them, you can go to jail. So that, make sure you understand that. Aspects have come through in the questions on inclusivity. And that, that's another aspect. That often involves the landscape architect. It'll involve the civil engineer as well um, in how we do that. You know, and the QS, as much as we all would whinge and say, oh, my God, this is going back down on cost, etc., it is. The client has a certain amount of money and has certain things that he wants to build and that's it it's not a bottomless pit um so we have to work within constraints and restraints which are there that are part of the actual overall process as i mentioned or even as part of say whether it be building regs or whatever so i think it was really good to see before with uh, ella and rachel when they talked about an understanding of the engineering side, because that's what I think as architects you have to have, simply an understanding. I, I do a lot of principal designer work. I have a lot of understanding on what lots of designers do. If you told me to design something like that, not a chance in hell. Uh, I, I couldn't do. But however, I do know who could, and I do know what, roughly what I'm looking for. So I think it's really important that within your team, you have your architect, who in my view could be your project manager, um, I think I would turn to Reba and say, Reba have seemed to let that slip for an awful lot and project managers are now separate entities, which is fine, but you know, the architects were there and let that go. Uh, but you do have to have somebody that's in charge. Somebody has to be there that's the focus, that's the lead. 
After that, you need your team, you need your engineers, you need a civil engineer, structural engineer, SIBSI engineer. SIBSI is the mechanical electrical. Do you know how much electricity is required? Do you know what where you're going to put? What size are the boilers going to be? What does that mean? How are we going to access them? You also then need, uh, you may need traffic if you're doing the overall master planning. You need your landscape architects. You need um, the principal designer, as I mentioned. With regards to health and safety, that is not something you must forget. We are just going through a process of Grenfell. Let's not forget that. At the moment, the industry is going to and is taking a right royal kicking over what is, looks awful and is awful. And yet there is processes in place that should stop that. Therefore, health and safety is important. You need to be thinking about how do I maintain uh, the buildings that you're doing? What am I going to do? How, how many times? A lot of solar panels on the roof that are great. Job I'm doing at the moment in South Shields, the client will say there, the biggest issue is bloody seagulls. What do I do? They're up there. They nest and they are an absolute threat to anybody going up to maintain. The, the uh, PV person says, oh, it only needs cleaning once every three years. When there's a shitload of seagulls around, it needs a lot more cleaning, leaves a lot more access up there. So have little things on those sort of aspects to, to things. These are things that you as designers need to be considering and bringing up. Your client might be able to give you some actual experience and say, God, this has always been our problem. What we've actually found good is the following. The job I'm looking at, they're trying all sorts. They have uh, uh, birds up there. They have models of birds. They have noises that might kick in. These sort of things. It, it sounds like a one that you say, oh, good grief. What is he going on about? It's a huge issue. <laughs> it's a bottom line issue that somebody has to deal with. It. You're going to send up and say, clean that, please. And they have to deal with it. You don't want them coming down saying, not a chance. I can't do it. How will your PI deal with it when the client says, well, you designed all this. I'm sorry, this isn't working for me. So there's lots of aspects to think on. And it is important that you consider all of these. Specifically, also remember cost. You have to remember cost. This is not something of which simply we have an unlimited budget. I think I've seen some brilliant work come through from people when they're fully a praising of costs. The Moby stuff with, uh, with, uh, with George Clark, some of the stuff that he's done where it's people have a little bit of money to spend and then they, they come up with something fantastic. That's brilliant. That's what we want to see. I remember seeing him in a talk and said, but I'll tell you what, here we go. Here's a job where I was employed, I don't know. It was a, a, an, under, an underbuild in a London building, which he added in swimming pools, cost millions, Money wasn't a budget. Yes, anybody can do anything then. But that isn't the real world of where we're at. Uh, and so therefore, what you're doing through this project, I think, is, is a great project because you'll be looking at a large area. You're being given a brief to say, have a run with it. Have, we want some ideas. You guys, the experts, you tell me. But don't forget you are part of a team. We all need each other. That's for definite. And we all should really understand what the other does and how they fit in so don't forget that don't want to be seeing teams of just one lot because quite frankly you're not going to answer all the questions and you're going to get asked a question you're not going to know that's why we have teams thank you thank you john that was that, that was brilliant yes a whole team of people is absolutely fantastic and you've led very nicely on to our client um, so, can I hand over to Neil Guthrie of um, Sunderland City Council? Neil. Oh, I thought I could follow. Um, I just want to start by sort of looking back a little bit over the, the fantastic programme we've had over the last four weeks. Um, I think Tabitha, um, with the assistance of the guys at Moby, really pulled together a comprehensive schedule of speakers from everyone from central government, industry experts, the leading voices in academia. I think it's probably an unprecedented lineup and certainly in you know, my days of university and, and learning my trade in the industry, 
you know, I certainly didn't have access to that level of talent and expertise. So um, certainly there's a great bit of thanks uh, on behalf of the council, got to Tabith and the team for pulling the program together. Um, we've obviously heard some insightful um, talks and webinars covering anything, everything from government policy, future living, design innovation, um, timber technology, carbon reduction, sustainability, the circular economy, cost planning, um, delivering innovation and design. And then, um, you know, as John just alluded to there, that the real importance of teamwork and coming together to deliver a holistic solution that satisfies ultimately the client brief. So, you know, a, a really insightful pro, uh, program and some really strong messages and some really good good knowledge and experience to take away and inform you know, what you can put together through the, through the competition. Um, I suppose my role tonight is to bring everything and the focus back to Sunderland. Um, we've obviously embarked on this programme as, as part of a wider uh, economic and develop economic and social economic regeneration of the city. Um, which includes a Future Living Expo, which we'll be holding in 2023. And this competition is a key part of that programme. Um, obviously, the site that we're using to support the challenge is Riverside Sunderland. Uh, and I'm planning now just to take you through a little presentation, um, just explain a little bit more about Riverside Sunderland, um, the, like, or the history, the heritage, um, and, and the future, and you know, give you a bit more um, insight into our aspirations so they can inform your your designs that you produce as part of the competition so you just bear with me I'll try and share my my screen and my presentation there are a couple of um, videos embedded so hopefully everything will go to plan So I'm hoping everybody can see my presentation. I'm sure Tabitha will shout up if they can't. All good, Neil. Excellent. So I just thought I'd start with a little bit of the history and heritage of, of the site and Riverside Sunderland. So Sunderland really started um, in the 18th century as three settlements surrounding the River Weir. It was a monastic settlement on the northern banks. Um, and in the sort of late 1700s, the first um, Weir Mouth Bridge was constructed, connecting the north and, and the south of the river. Um, in the early 19th century, the borough of Sunderland was created. And gradually, we saw the growth of new industrial districts and suburbs around the river. By the mid 19th century, Sunderland had become one of the greatest shipbuilding ports in the world. Um, and Bourne was the heavy industry that has guided the, the skyline um, and the economy of the city for many years. Um, you can see in the image from the 19th century, there's a power station emerged, which was um, fueled from the local coal mines. And there was a number of factories and workshops um, that grew to service the industry along the banks of the river. Um, up until well into the 20th century, the site was dominated by the coal industry. Um, the image you can see in the 20th century is, is Lampton Stairs, which is where they trans transferred the coal from the collieries onto the ships and off it went around the world. Um, by the 1970s, um, much of the industry had started to decline. Um, and certainly by the 1980s, we saw the, the death of coal mining you know, in the region, which left a big gap. Um, there was a rather famous brewery, which sat on the footprint of the site, um, which forms the basis of the challenge. But again, that, that closed, unfortunately, in 1999. And since then, the site has been pretty redundant. There have been a number of failed attempts at development um, and really a prime development site on the edge of the river has been left dormant. Um, just have another couple of slides showing some of the heritage and history. You can see the image on the left, it shows that you know, in times gone by, there was actually residential development on the site we're looking at. There was a former military garrison. You can start to see some of the, 
the tourist housing that um, you know is synonymous with with Sunderland as a city, but you know a mix of residential, commercial, and generally a vibrant place. Um, the image at the bottom of the screen, you know, from the 1800s, but it shows you know the ships, the activity. The river being the, the heart of the life in Sunderland, and I think, again, that is one of the things that's tied over, over recent years. And the image in the north just shows the power station um, in the coal mining, which, um, you know, that's an area that is now sort of what we're calling Riverside Park. So, you know, strong industrial heritage, really active and vibrant place. Um, and a lot of that has been, been lost through the death of industry. So in terms of Sunderland in the current day, um, you know, Sunderland is a passionate and proud place. Um, it has suffered a little bit in terms of the city centre from the growth of out of time development and out of time town investment. We've seen the development of a lot of out of town business parks, you know, housing estates on land that's been um, released from the green belt, but that's been to the detriment of the city centre. Um, you know, we can see the death in the retail industry at the moment. Um, and our city centre isn't functioning like the economic motor that it should do. Um, out of a population of 300,000, there's only around 3,000 people live in the city centre. Um, there's a lack of good quality housing and the market itself um, is really su suppressed as a result of the lack of people living there. Um, migration is out of the city is continuing. You know, we're losing people to live, people to work, but also talent good talent that's coming through local colleges and universities. Um, we are good and very capable at attracting um, inward investment, but we aren't great at supporting local businesses and the qualifications and skills of the local workforce, whilst they can churn exceptional outputs at low cost that don't always meet the needs of industry. Um, as a result of the industrial legacy and, you know, and some of the, I don't want to call it depression, but you know, that kind of thing that the city is suffering, you know, health outcomes aren't, aren't great. So we're on a, a social and economic regeneration, regeneration drive where we're looking to reverse that those trends, um, look to the future, you know, and create a healthy, active population with, with great opportunities around housing, employment, um, and just healthy and active lifestyles. In terms of River Sunderland, Riverside Sunderland itself, um, this is an aerial image of the site today. So you can see, you know, areas of undeveloped land, you know, a great riverside park that sits in the middle of the development zones um, and some industrial land on the north of the, the river, which um, then continues on onto the football stadium. Um, it's really a strategic edge of city location um, and should really be supporting um, the growth and regeneration of our city. Um, as you can see, you know, there's been a number of master plans for the regeneration of, of Riverside Sunderland. Um, for one reason or another, they have failed. I think we finally, um, as an authority, um, got the political direction and the executive strength to drive um, a successful economic growth strategy forward. We've already seen significant investment from the likes of Legal and General. Um, and momentum is really start, starting to grow and gather. Um, this image just gives an idea of, you know, some of the low quality and low value, value land uses that sit within you know, the boundaries of Riverside Sunderland and something that we're really trying to reverse and drive something more aspirational. Um, you saw some, some of the earlier images, you know, the importance and the activity um, of the river, you know, most Riverside, um, cities around the world um, are built around the river. Um, it's a hub of activity. Um, you know, we have some dramatic scenery, fantastic riverside location, but the, the site and the city has really turned its back on it. And that's what something that Riverside Sunderland is really trying to reverse. You know, you'll see from the, the green space that you can see from the aerial images, there's some fantastic parkland locations right on the edge of the city, right on the edge of the river, but they're quite inhospitable and um, they're poorly maintained and they're not, you know, an attractive destination. You know, they really should be the lifeblood of, blood of the city and a real destination um, for local people and people across the region. So you know, that's an area where we're really looking to intervene. 
We've also been very good in Sunderland at planning infrastructure. Um, if there's a highway to be built, we'll build it. And there is a um, fantastic dual carriageway that does its best to separate the city with Riverside Sunland. So we really need to break down those barriers, you know, and turn um, the image you can see there into a really attractive and active city street um, where the pedestrian you know, has the priority over the, over the car. I'm hoping this next slide is going to work. Shout up Tabitha if it doesn't. Perhaps for, for Sunderland in recent years is not only has employment sites and employment space been developed on the edge of town, leading to this sort of lower density um, sort of structure of the city, but also that's the same as happened for residential investment too. And we've seen a lot of uh, development right on the edge of Sunderland or even just a little bit beyond, which has implications for, uh, for public transport usage. It's more difficult to provide public transport when you've got things more spread out. It has issues in terms of trying to provide good public services as well if you haven't got that density in place. And so I think trying to encourage a bit of that density from a residential point of view as well as a commercial point of view um, is, a, is a really important aspect of trying to make something that I think fit for, you know, not only for the 2020s and the 2030s, but actually the 2050s and 2060s too. So that brief sort of snapshot from, from Paul really enforces the importance of um, a good quality housing scheme and the right housing density to the growth of the city. So that would be a really important consideration as part of your design proposals. So, you know, what about the future? What are our aspirations for Riverside Sunland? So we really want to create a sustainable new urban quarter at the heart of the city. Um, we are redefining what the city is and what it does um, and transforming what we believe is a, a spectacular site into a rather unique urban quarter and an extraordinary place to live, work and play. You know, we don't believe there's anywhere else in the UK where we have such dramatic scenery right at the heart of the city um, with such a great opportunity to create you know, a new community where people can, can live, can work and can, and can play. Um, so in terms of the residential element, um, Riverside Sunderland uh, will deliver a thousand new homes. It will double the city centre population. Um, it will be a place for people of all ages. So we really want to retain um, the talent and attract new people to live in the city centre. Um, that includes families, key workers, young people, you know, people who haven't had the opportunity. I think a lot of people who live in the heart of this, the city of Sunderland do so because they have to, not because they've chosen to. So we really want to create homes and communities where people choose to live. Um, we'll be looking at a variety of tenure solutions which maximise people's ability you know, to access a new home. So whether that's for affordable rent, market rent, um, or for open market sale. The homes themselves will be, you know, we hope they're going to be stunning. They'll be built to the highest quality standards, you know, manufactured using advanced and off-site manufacturing techniques incorporating low carbon you know, energy efficient technology. Um, in terms of the location, it'll have spectacular views over the river and over the parks. Um, you know, given the proximity of the city centre, it has fantastic access to local services. Um, you know, within the residential development, we're looking to see you know, community gardens, green spaces where people can socialise and interact. You know, on the back of the pandemic, we want to really grow, regrow that, that community spirit and that, that community ethos. Um, you know, the development itself will be a short walk from you know, shops, entertainment. So it'll be a really exciting place to live and really redefining you know, city centre living um, in Sunderland and the North East and just generally a, a special place to be. Um, we're in the process of creating a new central business district. We've already delivered a speculative office development and have headline tenants such as a car door. We've just had a hundred million pound investment from legal and general. We're also going to deliver two speculative office schemes um, on the Riverside Sunderland site. And they're also already uh, starting to attract anchor tenants. So people can really see the ambition and the opportunity that lies um, at Riverside Sunderland. Um, we're really trying to diversify the employment offer that we can provide um, in modern, stylish workspace you know, that, that is a nice, comfortable environment to work in. So it's not reliant on you know, 
air conditioning, you know, gas central heating, those kind of things. We're, we're really trying to go to a more natural and low carbon and environmentally friendly solution. And we've seen people like uh, Legal and General who really want to push the bar. Um, it's not just about uh, driving basic solutions anymore. You know, to attract top companies, top employers, we really, really need to push the standards. Um, we really want to retain our talent. I've, I've talked about that a few times. You know, we want to inspire the local population. We want to encourage the people coming through our universities and colleges to establish a base in Sunderland, you know, set up business here and drive a more entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Um, you know, Riverside Sunderland is a, a fantastic accessible location. You know, we've already got 5G technology. You know, that's going to provide huge opportunity for, for businesses as they, as they grow, you know, particularly in the modern era, having that level of con connectivity is so important. Um, and generally, you know, site and business and employees at the heart of the city will drive, you know, footfall and expenditure in the city economy and help that economic growth trajectory that I've talked about on a couple of the slides. Um, we also see Riverside Sunderland as an important place to play. So we want to really revitalise the Riverside Park, create it into a people's park where people come in to interact with the landscape, the biodiversity, you know, nature generally. Um, create you know new paths and lighting which improve accessibility um you know for people uh, uh, multiple requirements um create new spaces for play and exercise you know we want to promote the likes of park run and things like that you know really trying to create an active vibrant space um it'll be a focal point for walking and cycling there's an existing coast to coast route that we'd like to connect up with we want to create cafes and pavilions where people can sit and enjoy the space and, and socialise. Um, we're looking to encourage people to take you know, ownership of their own health and well-being, so creating you know, places for community growing, you know, allotments, orchards, things like that, where we can really educate people around healthy and active lifestyles. Um, increasing that connectivity with the river, so introducing water sports and just generally bringing the river back to, you know to play an essential role as the part of people's everyday lives and um, driving you know an events and animations program again that supports the vibrancy of, of, of the park and um, ultimately you know trying to create a, a destination that the people in the local community and across the region uh, you know want to come and enjoy We also see Riverside Sunderland as an important place to, to learn. We do have a strong cultural heritage. Um, you know, we've recently achieved um, significant future high streets funding, which will help us deliver a new culture house, which will include a city library, a studies and archive centre, which will be all aimed at families and young people. So really, you know, have, have those kind of people connecting with the past, but also the future and the ambition of the city. Um, we're developing a new 450 seat auditorium, which will be a musical and cultural venue. Uh, housing Innovation and Construction Skills Academy, where we're looking to train and educate housing professionals and workforce of the future, you know, training them in advanced manufacturing, modern methods of construction, and supporting um, the retrofit agenda across the city. So there'll be a strong partnership there between education and industry. We've already got key partners in, in Moby and Sunderland College and the Northeast uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. We also want to support the growth in, of our local colleges and universities, both in housing and construction skills, you know, advanced manufacturing, um, and also uh, our local medical school, um, which will really help, we hope, to drive you know, better outcomes for our students, but also um, for, for local people. I can't reinforce uh, enough the importance of the connectivity and mobility, and we really want the design solutions that are developed as part of the competition you know, to take into account what, it, what a smart city may do and may feel like, and what a smart home technology you know, is really the future of housing design. Um, like I mentioned, we're one of the first you know, 5G enabled cities in the UK. We're currently Smart City of the Year 2021, We've recently entered into a contract to deliver a high speed fibre network around the whole of the city, um, which we would have an interest in so we can ensure that all of our residents and all of our businesses have, have 
you know, direct access to those those fantastic levels of connectivity. Um, you know, we want Riverside Sunland to encourage sustainable transport solutions, so walking, cycling, you know, connections with public transport, utilizing mobility hubs so we can car share, you know, focus on electric vehicles, really starting to think what the communities of the future really going to look like and how we can maximize the quality and um, activity of, of the public realm and our green spaces. We really want to deliver a carbon neutral urban quarter. We've committed to um, being carbon neutral by 2030. So we're investing heavily um, in achieving those outcomes. Um, we'll have to work closely with industry. You know, in our strategic regeneration projects like um, Riverside Sunland, we'll really need to be aspirational in terms of you know, carbon induction, renewable energy, modern methods of construction, you know, to really drive that carbon neutral solution. Um, we do have some valuable assets. We have a river. We have a lot of existing mine workings with mine water that's that's available, you know, at, at, a, at a good temperature for supporting a, a citywide heat network. So we're starting, you know, we're embarking on a, pro, a process of feasibility studies if how we can utilise those natural assets, but how we can also create smart energy grids. So. You know, on the micro level and then at a more macro level as the development progresses, but you know, really taking into account um, peak and minimum demand, balancing between residential and commercial uses, so we really have the optimum energy and carbon solution across Riverside Sunderland. So you can see that we, we're really ambitious, um, you know, there's a lot of thought going into what we're trying to achieve and we're really trying to push the bar. Um, you know, that we are starting to receive a lot of interest I and mean, we have a lot of supporters, a lot of people trying to you know, influence and encourage us in the direction of travel. Sunderland is a changing city and it's changing fast. It's brilliant to see the huge investment going into Sunderland Riverside, which is going to transform the city centre. Sunderland has always been a great city. It's in a fantastic location and it's got brilliant people. But now we're going to have the opportunity to bring people back to live, to work, to play, to lead healthy lifestyles. It will look back to our traditions and our heritage from the past, but it will also be providing the platform for the innovation and the embracing of future technologies, which will make Sunderland such a vibrant city for the future. It's so important that people come back to city centres to bring them back to life again. And I really look forward to watching the transformation that's going on in Sunderland Riverside. I don't know about everybody else, but I find the likes of Steve and, and George Clark, who's a local guy and really behind what we're doing, they're so inspirational. They're so bought into what we're trying to achieve. And I think this challenge you know, provides a real opportunity for you know, students across the country to be part of that and influence what we're trying to achieve. So I just wanted to close by you know, really summarising and saying this is Riverside Sunland. We believe it's the most ambitious city centre regeneration project in the UK. We want to create a carbon neutral urban quarter at the heart of the city in a new, a unique place to live, work and play. And we really look forward to seeing your entries and your imagination and innovation um, as part of the challenge. So I wish you all the best of luck and look forward to seeing your entries. Thank you, Neil. That was fabulous. I don't know if I just want to come and live in Sunderland or whether I want to enter the competition or just have you as a client. I'm just like, I, you know, I'm like, oh, which one? But I love my beloved Wales, so I'm not coming. <laughs> You're safe from here for a little bit longer. Um, and so, I mean, a fabulous array of speakers again, you know, to, to, to all focuses in the right direction with David and Fionn and Jerry and Rachel and Ella and John and Neil but ignore me. I need to share screens and this is where I get everything wrong. There you go, our fabulous speakers for tonight. And I just want to take you back as we're talking to about carbon neutral and building for the future. Timber will be one of those pallets of materials that, we, that you will use and to use it wisely and well, we want you to understand it. 
So I work for TRADA, which is the Timber Research and Development Association, and also for the Timber Trade Federation. So if you want to know anything about timber, come and talk to us. As a student or a lecturer or a professional, come to the TRADA website. Students get free access, so don't uh, register here. Head to the academic page, click on that button, scroll down until you come to the big orange section, and you will get access to 63 units and eight modules all about timber, from timber as a material through its environmental aspects, um, further topics, and even into fire. There are 100 plus case studies and an infinite number of wood information sheets. And we also have books online. So timber frame construction, all these are open to students to read and members online. We had off-site and industrialized timber construction. So this is your modern methods of construction. Are you going to go platform? Are you going to go balloon? Are you going to go open panel? Are you going to use CLT? Are you going to use eye joists? Go and read Robert Hairstand's books. And if you go back to week one, Robert gave us a quick run through of it. Are you, as every architect wants to go for, are you going to look at cross laminated timber? Is it the right timber? Is it the right product for your particular design? Do you want to do a quick ready reckoner of um, which timber you should use? Which timber product, sorry, not, so are you going to use again the eye joist, the solid timber, the CLT, the LVL, the glue lamb? This will get, point you in the right direction. And whether you're an engineer, an architect, a cost consultant, I've been told don't call them QSs, they don't like it, or even a landscape architect, go and have a look at designing timber structures, because this book takes you directly from the forest all the way through to your finished building, and we can all learn from it. But we couldn't bring you this competition in partnership with Sunderland City Council and Moby, who I'd both like to thank, without the uh, money from our sponsors. And our main ones are the Confederation of Timber Industries, and you will have heard them speak earlier in this webinar series. Akoya, who also spoke, and Rotherblas, because they say they bring everything to a project apart from the timber. So I think you should go out and check them out. The Timber Decking and Cladding Association. Are you going to use timber cladding? Have you gone at decking? They have a unique amount of resources for you to go and explore. And is your timber that you are going to use going to come from a sustainable uh, source? Are you going to have a chain of custody? And how are you going to prove that? So PEFC are one of those um, certification um, companies and they provided a whole lot of resources for you to go and look at. And the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, we heard about natural insulation from them, and they explained what the benefits are of using those particular products. Definitely go back and view the webinar and go and look at the resources. And Wood for Good, you'll be looking at your EPDs and your life cycle assessments. So we, for this competition, we're using the Field and Clegg Bradley Studios Carbon Tool. But you'll need to go and also look at the Wood for Good um, website to get more information, plus all the manufacturers and um, EPDs. And are you going to use homegrown timber? Go and check out BSW. They've got a mill not far from Sunderland. And are you going to come and join us in our virtual pub tomorrow? This is where we make friends. We talk about um, all sorts of sustainable things. We have a mad evening and we form fantastic teams. I'd like to take you back to the beginning of the week where we had structural area engineering um, all about residential. Are you going to go with the concrete um, footings? You know, which product are you going to use? Are you going to use local timber? I see we've got Robert uh, in the room tonight. So you've got another chance to question him. And again, it was just not for engineers. Architects, landscape architects, uh, cost consultants all um, need to understand, you know, everybody else's language and, and how we all work together. And last night we had a pro procurement, costing and placemaking. So Kelly, an engineer who sits on our, um, the Trada board, introduced the evening. 
Ollie took us in to quantity surveying and cost consulting. Alex took us back as an architect back into the designs. And then Rob and Danny from Cast took you really deep into depth of where you would start with costing. And as they were saying, engineers can be cost consultants, architects can be cost consultants, landscape architects can be cost consultants. The more you understand each other and take a go interdisciplinary, you know, stop working in silos, the, um, the better designs you'll probably come up with. And that is how we need to go forward. And placemaking and nature. How do you bring that back into the heart of your design in our communities? Gemma put forward some fabulous, um, not only ideas, but some resources that you will um, have access to. And this is Riverside Sunderland, such a fantastic site. Outlined here in red, this is your, where a hundred homes you will design and um, master plan for. And this is the area, the pink area. But we want you to really concentrate on the design, the engineering and the detailing for one three bedroom home. We say it's a family home, but you tell us who your family is going to be. It could be, you know, a group of students who are what's saying it could be young professionals. You know, what is the modern day family or how do you want to live? You know, if you tell us who you've designed for, that is definitely really going to help. Are you going to use the whole nine by six meters or are you going to think of it differently? We look forward to seeing uh, what you produce. And this is the end of week four. And this has been the webinar series that sets the scene for the Riverside Sunderland University Design Challenge. And I'd like to say a big thank you to our range of fantastic speakers and our stalwarts who have been in the audience throughout. And if you've missed any of them, go to the YouTube channel and catch up.